Hi, everyone, and welcome to number seven of our series of lectures, The Art of Relationships, focusing on individual artists represented in creative exchanges, the exhibition currently on view at the Paula Krasner House. I want to thank Victoria Pilato, Stony Brook University's Digital Projects Librarian, for co-hosting this series, which is made possible by a generous gift from Dorothy Lichtenstein and Stony Brook's John H. Marburger III Memorial Fund. The exhibition, Creative Exchanges, uh, and we have our co-curator with us today, Teresa Davis. The show comprises work by artists listed in Pollock and Krasner's address books, who were especially important to them, one of them being Reuben Kadish, Pollock's friend from their teen years in Los Angeles. It was Reuben and his wife, Barbara, who invited Jackson and Lee to share their 1945 summer rental in Springs, which led Jackson and Lee's moving there. So it's thanks to the Kadishes that we have the Paula Krasner House. Kadish's artistic legacy is stewarded by Judd Tully, chairman of the Reuben Kadish Art Foundation, who will discuss the artist's career as a painter and sculptor. Judd is an award-winning journalist, widely published art critic, and writer for publications ranging from Cigar Aficionado and Flash Art Magazine to the San Francisco Chronicle, Washington Post, and Blue Art Info. He's currently reporting on the international auction and art fair market, regularly appearing in Artsy, the Art Newspaper, the Rob Report, and many others, and has been frequently interviewed on BBC Radio, CNN, and MSNBC. He's appeared in a number of documentary films that chronicle the rise and fall of the art market and scandals associated with it, including the CNBC American Greed, The Art of the Steel, featuring exploits of disgraced art dealer and convicted felon, Larry Salander. Judd is also a filmmaker whose most recent endeavor, The Melt Goes On Forever, The Art and Times of David Hammonds, is playing at select film festivals worldwide. So before I turn it over to Judd, I'm gonna ask you to remain muted during his talk. You may put questions or comments in the chat or wait for the Q&A, which will follow. So Judd, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, okay. Um, are we on the first image, I believe? Uh, you need to share your screen. Okay, let me uh, go back uh, one second. Sorry, I'll get there eventually. Uh, well, we okay. can't start without you. I know. Okay, preview. Let me get out of here. Um, sorry. Okay, let's share screen. Sorry. All right, and then we will go to here. So, uh, Ruben Kadish was born in Chicago in 1913, uh, the same year as uh, Philip Gustin, and his Russian emigre family moved to Los Angeles when he was seven. And they came from uh, uh, Tsarist Russia, from uh, uh, Kavno, which was a center of Jewish intellectual cultural life. And when Kadish was uh, seven, the family moved to um, Los Angeles. Uh, early on a radical, uh, he was expelled from high school for his leftist activism and in similar fashion, didn't last long as a student at the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles. He had already forged a close friendship with fellow student radical and budding artist Philip Guston, then known as Philip Goldstein. Already an extraordinary draftsman, Kadish in rapid fashion developed his painting and printmaking skills. And here is the first uh, image uh, from 1937, I'm jumping a little bit. It's not exactly in chronological order what we'll be seeing today, um, but this is uh, uh, gives you some sense of his uh, draftsmanship. And 
Uh, barely 20 years old, Kadish worked on controversial murals executed uh, in Los Angeles, for instance, in 1933, one like Tropical America were destroyed. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. Why is this not going here? Um, i go this way. Um, it's another work from the same year, um, which I mistakenly always thought it was a portrait of Diego Rivera, but it's Enrico Biagio. Um, um, and here we go uh, to the first. Um, so anyway, I was talking about Tropical America. It was destroyed by the notorious Red Squad of the LA Police Department. Um, the work demonstrated Ruben Kadish's gripping realism with decidedly leftist and surrealist flourish, <coughs> flourishes. <coughs> influenced uh, by the likes of the Mexican firebrand artist, David Alfaro Siqueiros, who spent time in Los Angeles and uh, Kadish as a youngster, teenager, worked as kind of a gopher for him. And also another big influence at the time was the uh, LA-based teacher and artist, Lorser Feitelson. Um, <clears throat> Kadish and Gustin uh, became a kind of mural muralist tag team, first and most improbably in Morelia, Mexico, which we'll get to in a moment, and back in LA. <laughs> and um, this is an image of uh, the City of Hope mural in Duarte, California. This is dated from 1935. And this was the second mural that Kadish and uh, Gustin did. And as you can see, it has a <clears throat> less threatening theme. The title was, um, this was a, at the time a tuberculosis sanitarium. Now it's a world-class cancer uh, center um, in Duarte. And uh, the title is Physical Growth of Man, of a Man in History of Medicine. And it followed close on the heels of their triumphant 1,024 square foot Morelia, Mexico mural in fresco. Let me uh, just quickly move here. There you see the two artists um, in uh, <clears throat> Duarte. <clears throat> and uh, that's... Uh, showing a very skinny Ruben Kadish uh, with some, uh, an example of the mural. Uh, and uh, now we're moving to uh, Morelia and the struggle against war and fascism. Um, now you might wonder like how in the heck did uh, Gustin and Kadish and their poet friend, Jules Langsner get to Mexico which was in a uh, somewhat decrepit car, but it was really because of David Alfaro Siqueiros, who uh, knew both men, Kadish and Gustin, and uh, had a commission to do a mural, and, um, but was uh, off to the, um, uh, Spain to participate in the, uh, what was going on there in the Spanish Civil War and uh, basically uh, crown Kadish and Gustin to uh, come down and, and, and execute that mural. Uh, and as you can see, it's nothing like the uh, sort of calmer, more peaceful one that they did later in uh, Morelia. Um, so it was titled <clears throat> in their various interpretations of the struggle, of the title, uh, I'm going with struggle against war and fascism. Uh, sometimes it's called Ellen Landau to struggle against terrorism. Uh, this is 1934-35. Uh, and uh, it was only rediscovered miraculously in 1973 after decades, <coughs> excuse me, hidden behind a temporary wall there and uh, at any rate, it cemented their youthful 
um, reputations. They're both 22 years old at the time. Um, Time Magazine characterized the duo as quote unquote parlor pinks, which is a, I guess at the time a phrase to show their <clears throat> communist leanings. And they quoted Sequeiros <clears throat> as the most promising painters in the US and Mexico. Um, so now we kind of can move forward. Um, here we see um, Kadish, Jules Langsner, um, Phil Gustin on the scaffolding. Uh, of the uh, palace, which at the time it's now a, it's a university. And the mural, by the way, has been restored exquisitely. Um, and uh, you can go there today. And this kind of reminds me of like Via Zapata kind of um, some of the people that were moving there. And there was the rumor that they had to cut short their visit in Mexico, and I don't want to be sued about this, but apparently Jules Langsner got involved with um, one of the uh, dignitaries' wives at the time, and they had to beat it out of town. So there they are, um, uh, Gustin, Kadish, and Langsner. Um, and here's another detail uh, that was taken probably in the 70s, uh, photographed by a close friend of Kadish's, um, Beryl Sokolov, who actually made a film of the mural, which has unfortunately disappeared from sight. He was a well-known uh, filmmaker and journalist. <clears throat> I'm just going back for a second <clears throat> to an early work collaboration uh, at the Workers Alliance Center mural. That was the title of it. And just to give you a sense of the minds of uh, Gustin and Kadish, on the far right, you see Karl Marx, uh, Lenin, and uh, this very sort of surreal, curvy uh, thing, Workers of the World Unite. And uh, you might see some, there's a, a cross, <clears throat> a Nazi symbol. And um, so you get the powerhouse imagery they were making very early on. Um, and now we're moving to uh, a solo effort um, of Kadish called A Dissertation of Alchemy, 1937, um, a fresco that's currently at the um, Haight Street Art Center, which I haven't visited, but uh, that was another um, uh, miracle uh, uh, recovery effort because where the mural had been, which was part of the teacher's college at San Francisco State, um, later became a kind of homeless encampment. And um, now the Haight Street Arts Center has taken uh, 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 control of the uh, piece and it's restored and it looks amazing. Um, and um, this is a, another work of Kadish. He went on, by the way, um, after that one WPA mural, he submitted, and he was actually head of the San Francisco Works Progress Administration uh, mural project. And he submitted something like 26 designs and only one was accepted, probably because of their political content. <clears throat> and here's a, 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 um, an easel uh, painting. Um, by Kadish that's um, at the um, LA County Museum, I believe. Um, you can see the influence of surrealism um, <clears throat> and um, remarkable draftsmanship and uh, 
Here's another, this is um, a portrait of um, Kadish's father, Samuel Kadish, who was a uh, painting contractor based when, I mean, when they moved to Los Angeles, he developed a business there. And uh, his father was, a, according to family lore and research, uh, was a radical in his own right in Kavno, uh, was a member of the Bund. And um, it's one of my favorite works in terms of um, both a portrait and um, kind of an homage to, uh, to the artist. Uh, his father. Um, this is another canvas, um, Lamentation from 1934, 35, excuse me, and uh, an early mural study. And I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, I'm just to the 1940s, if you want to see where artists can move in terms of uh, the times. Um, but this is uh, an untitled work. And obviously you see the, uh, you know, the burgeoning uh, abstract expressionist movement. Um, there are not many uh, paintings from this period that survived um, what I believe uh, was a fire that took place <clears throat> at Kadish's uh, uh, studio, Quonson Hut in uh, New Jersey. Um, and as we go back a little bit in time, um, and I really like these two photographs. So on the left is Jackson Pollock. Um, reading, bare-chested, sitting in a kind of wicker chair. And that's photographed by Kadish. And then on the right is a photograph that Jackson took of his friend, Reuben Kadish. And in the background, and this was at Pollock's <clears throat> uh, apartment on um, um, West uh, 8th Street, and I'm sorry, 46 East 8th Street with the work in progress, Guardians of the Secret in the background. Um, and as uh, Helen earlier in her introduction um, already mentioned the you know, friendship and involvement of the two couples, Lee Krasner and Jackson and Barbara Kadish uh, and um, Ruben, and these are some stills from that 2000 um, Hollywood film, um, Pollock, that uh, Ed Harris directed and starred in, which portrayed Kadish in a fairly negative light, um, uh, whatever, but um, it's always nice to get on this <clears throat> Hollywood screen. Um, and one thing I would just say, just kind of in passing that um, late in his life, Kadish was almost constantly contacted by various art historians, journalists, asking him to talk about his friendship with Jackson Pollock and, or, you know, Philip Guston, who also became a, a superstar during the um, uh, 1950s. And uh, I think it was difficult for I mean, he he grudgingly was, you know, forthcoming uh, uh, about that, but um, he had his kind of 15 minutes of Warholian fame, um, and there were big periods where uh, he was uh, more in the background. And uh, here's some extraordinary works uh, in pastel, ballpoint, um, in towards the end of 1943. So this would be maybe 10 years after less than the murals. Uh, Kadish was recruited uh, 
by Henry Varnum Poor, who ran the uh, US Army Artists Unit, uh, where they were documenting what was going on in various theaters of war. And though Kadish wished he could have been sent to Europe, he wound up in um, Burma, uh, now Myanmar, uh, uh, Calcutta, uh, and basically documented uh, the horrible civilian atrocities that were going there. Um, and um, again, uh, this is, uh, you know, on the street, he observed this and it was hugely influential on his sense of uh, destruction and, um, you know, world war and uh, poverty and uh, starvation. Um, uh, and um, there are quite a, quite a number of them. At the same time, uh, he got a big, uh, in-depth look at uh, India, the cultural, the temples, the figures, the sculptures that would um, greatly influence his uh, work later on. And uh, let me see where I'm going here with this. Um, oh, let me just back step for a half a second. Back to the Pollock film. A lot of that was based on this uh, the research or whatever was based on this enormous um, uh, biography uh, on Pollock by the Pulitzer Prize winning team of Stephen Nifa and Gregory White Smith. And they quote Kadish on Jackson Pollock in the book at different times. But the one that I liked best was, this is Kadish speaking about Pollock. He was a bad boy. I was a bad boy. We felt the same way about each other right from the beginning. Which I always got a kick out of that. Um, um, so this is uh, now jumping from the 40s, his World War II uh, experience. Uh, he's already moved from San Francisco to the East Coast, to New York, to Long Island City, looking for a place. Helen described, uh, well, uh, they had three sons and uh, they couldn't find proper, uh, a big enough place and they wound up in uh, New Jersey uh, on a farm. But anyway, so this is 1961 and this is Kadish's breakout show at the Poindexter Gallery. And um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it just shows the sort of transformation um, from uh, mural, muralist, printmaker, easel painter to sculptor. And, uh, and here's a uh, interior shot and you can see Kadish uh, under that great looking uh, doorway with uh, some of his works. Um, and so this is after um, a period that he unfortunately missed in New York, which was the, um, you know, 10th Street, all of the, uh, although he was in a few shows, um, he was really uh, building a dairy herd in, um, in, in Vernon and had missed out on a lot of that activity, uh, which he uh, was later in life looked back upon that that was not such a great thing. Uh, although he was a very successful dairy farmer, organized a collective of uh, dairy farmers and um, excelled. Um, so uh, looking back a little bit um, in terms of what critics thought of Kadish's uh, work, um, we have, um, Thomas B. Hess, 
who was um, a standout critic and reputation maker, wrote in the fall of 1959, <clears throat> Art News, two years before we're looking at this show, um, with a quote, um, one of the lesser known of American sculptural talents, Kadish seizes the throat of the contemporary reality without style, without pretense. This is it. Um, <clears throat> and um, so when he had the show at uh, Poindexter, another uh, major critic at the time, uh, Lawrence Campbell wrote, um, uh, it is as though these were ancient archaic works that Kadish had grabbed by their throats, shook like dogs and forced to be modern. Has a ring to it. Um, and here's uh, Kadish uh, in his studio. Um, and here's, uh, <clears throat> on the left is Herman Cherry, uh, a painter, a uh, close friend of Kadish and many of the Abex artists, very close with David Smith. And it was Herman Sherry <clears throat> who had a, a job. He ran the gallery of the Stanley Rose Bookshop and Gallery in Los Angeles in the 1930s. And that was a famous uh, literary salon, short-lived, um, and that gave uh, Kadish his uh, first exhibition and as well as uh, Philip Gustin, I believe. And I just wanted in passing to thank um, uh, Musa Meyer and Thomas Meyer and the whole family and of uh, the Gustins um, for supporting the Ruben Kadish Art Foundation. And um, just, Moving along here, okay. There's uh, Kadish reading the newspaper, um, something about Lindsay. So we know that's in the 1960s. And here's some work, um, Double Jack from uh, at his farm in, uh, in Vernon. That's Barbara Kadish, who was a uh, archeologist who did many uh, digs in Turkey, wrote papers uh, for NYU and uh, provided uh, Kadish with uh, extraordinary, uh, I believe, uh, imagery, image banks of research she had done uh, over the years. And that's why Kadish is so uh, fluent in um, you know, many cultures. Um, and I would love to know exactly where this sculpture is or was, but I love the photograph of uh, kind of the sky passing. Um, um, and this is Wandering Oedipus. Uh, that was in that uh, Poindexter show. Um, Seer from 1966, <clears throat> uh, Eleusis, and again, uh, you can see um, when he moved into uh, from terracotta uh, and then uh, bronze casting. And um, I have the belief that that is Kadish in the, um, in the background, possibly. Um, this was in 76 um, with the same sculpture. Um, um, here's uh, one of, uh, another favorite of mine, Gregor from uh, the famous uh, Franz Kafka, novel um it's in it's not in bronze this is a ceramic piece um, but it's when the uh figure is wakes up and he's transmogrified into an insect 
And I always see this as um, kind of the touchstone for Kadesh's own um, uh, breakthrough, as it were, from uh, transformation, metamorphosis from painter to sculptor. And uh, there was a show at Pollock Krasner some years ago that uh, uh, Helen Harris, Harrison was responsible for that showed some of those works. And here is uh, Kadish with some of his Earth Mother works. Again, you see the influence of India, of myths, of uh, Earth Mothers, of fertility, of the soil. Um, and uh, both in bronze and in terracotta. It's another photograph of, of Kadesh. Um, and here's a jump. Uh, this is um, Azteca. This is a later work. Um, and again, all you know, filtering through his hands and brain, um, world cultures, uh, women, especially, uh, um, this is the bronze version, um, terracotta works. And he, um, for many years, I mean, decades actually, he was uh, teaching um, art history at the Cooper Union in New York, just a block or so away from his uh, carriage house on um, East 9th Street, where he did a lot of uh, work there. Um, Fallen Angel. And uh, when he was at home, um, he had a little sand casting operation going on in his basement. These are tiny figures, but I kind of whether they're soldiers, cycladic influence, um, like a whole army, and he had them displayed in his studio. Uh, there were dozens and dozens of them. Uh, you'll see more of it. And here's uh, Griffin, um, a copper piece. Uh, and uh, from the 70s, uh, back and forth between terracotta and bronze, uh, Jocasta three. Um, so in a way, um, one of the interesting facets of Kadish's life is an image and maker that, you know, you to really take it in, you would really have to have some knowledge about what some of these names signify, which is probably more difficult today for um, less read folks. Um, and this was, um, this is his last series, his memorial Holocaust series, not necessarily like, you know, across the board Holocaust that he started in the, um, was, basically 40 years after Hiroshima, the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And uh, that's what started Kadish's, um, uh, these heads, these memorial heads that he made. Um, again, in terracotta first, and then some of them were in bronze, some of them are unique. Um, and uh, keep going here. Um, this is Spartacus. And again, you always see uh, from his abex turmoil, interior, emotional work, the um, deeply scored surfaces all over surface. And um, interestingly, um, some of it he carved when he was on his farm with uh, a sharpened uh, pig's rib. He was a man of the earth. Um, and uh, here's uh, some other images, um, etching. Uh,
powerhouse image maker. Ah, so um, I was always struck by Kadish's uh, handwriting or printing and doodling everywhere. But it fits so beautifully in the uh, current exhibition at the Pollock Krasner House in terms of um, um, here's Esteban Vicente's number, uh, sketches on the side, um, and uh, and this has only recently been um, uh, discovered, so to speak, since we've been doing research and finally getting into some of the uh, voluminous um, trays of slides and um, ephemera, so to speak, of Kadish that has been in storage for a long time. So, so hopefully we'll have some more. Um, but um, here on, you see Cherry, October 2nd, that's his friend Herman Cherry. Uh, over here, you have the phone number for Grace, as in Grace Borgnacht, his dealer for uh, many years, um, whose husband, uh, Warren Brandt, was a, also a close friend of, of, of uh, Kadish. And uh, it's one of my, this is, fits him to a T in terms of um, uh, father's love SP 100 welders, 110 volts from Santa. Uh, and this is uh, November 91, he died in September of 92. So this was very much towards the end of his life. Um, and uh, Another monotype. I believe this is, uh, I would call this a self portrait. We can see those eyes and the spectacles. Um, and uh, this is uh, an opening at, uh, I believe it was um, uh, at the short lived but significant Artist Choice Museum on West Broadway. Uh, so this would date from 1985. Uh, it was an artist-run museum. Um, and uh, this is uh, gives you sort of a, uh, oh, by the way, I mentioned Esteban Vicente. Here he is. Uh, this was an exhibition um, that I curated uh, at One Penn Plaza, corporate, uh, uh, st still standing. Um, uh, in October of 1983, and uh, it was called Vintage New York. And uh, there's Rue Herman Cherry, their close friend Dorothy Daner, uh, Milton Resnick, well, you can see the names, uh, Edward Dugmore, uh, Livia, and Elsie Driggs, who was an extraordinary painter, has a great work at the Whitney. Uh, and this is uh, the late Carollo Vandehouten. Um, who was the art advisor who organized all of that. And uh, let me think about this for a second. I think I'm the only one that's still around. And forgive me if there's someone here that's not, but, uh, oh, and this is uh, just a picture of Ruva and uh, at the farm and, uh, from the old days. And he's working away. Another uh, exhibition. Uh, and there's a uh, wandering Oedipus there, Gregor, uh, many of his monoprints. Um, And uh, that's a photograph by uh, Sarah Wells, um, who documented a lot of the work of different artists. Um, and Rube is standing in his um, 9th Street 
the middle of his Ninth Street uh, studio salon, and I detect a very slight smile signifying to me a satisfied creator of uh, remarkable forms. It's another photograph of, of his um, work and uh, jumping uh, to the more recent uh, times. Um, this is his uh, solo exhibition at the Eric Firestone Gallery that took place in 2022, um, really just uh, a year ago. Um, and uh, some images, and you can see along this very long shelf, that was his uh, army of uh, small figures. And, uh, Here's another image, we go here. And these are uh, the heads. I mean, I wouldn't have called the exhibition Earth Mothers because it was way beyond that, but you know, it's okay. Uh, we see Spartacus up there, but it was, it, uh, to me, it, it was really like a kind of cinematic look at his uh, last and lasting uh, body of work that he began in the mid uh, 1980s and uh, some more of his uh, monotypes. And um, <clears throat> so these last group, uh, images, uh, I'm going to quote and uh, close with the um, uh, a little soundbite from the hyperallergic critic Tim Kaine, who wrote of the exhibition, Kadish's fossil-like heads, forms, and figures remind us that every civilization, including our own, eventually collapses. <clears throat> so on that bright note, I would uh, open uh, the uh, proceedings back to Helen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judd. Uh, I mean, I, of course, knew Ruben's work from his contact with us when the museum was in its early days. And he volunteered to give us some insights into his relationship with Jackson. And he also gave us a couple of the plates that he had taught, where he had taught Jackson how to use the engraving burin. And he was extremely generous, but I could sense that he really was perhaps, I wouldn't say bitter, but certainly very um, ambivalent about, as Lee was herself the fact that people were always looking through him to get to Jackson and looking through her to get to Jackson. So the idea of being kind of eclipsed or under underappreciated as an artist, you were just a conduit for information about Pollock. I think I, I understood his reticence to some degree, but I was very glad that we were able to pay tribute to him with the exhibition that you so kindly helped us arrange of his paintings and sculpture. Because I think many people who do know his sculpture really don't, don't know his paintings, but there are so few of them that have survived except for the couple of murals. But I wondered, did Life Magazine actually run those? Um, no, no that, that was, um, they were sponsors and they might have published other artists' work, but, um, the ones that I showed you are part of the, um, they're actually in the, um, I don't know if it's still called the Pentagon Museum, but they do have an art museum. Hmm. And this was um, uh, something that started back in World War I in terms of having artists go to combat, you know, embedded in various um, uh, theaters of war. Um, so the, 
Life magazine, I think, was more of a uh, uh, you know financial backing or whatever. Oh, sort of sponsoring. Um, so, it, right? so I have not. I I do not have any uh, awareness of of him being published in Life. He did get into Time magazine when he was twenty two, though. Really? Huh. Yeah, when after in that they did a big review of the Morelia mural. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, if you would like to unmute yourselves, you're welcome to do that. Uh, you don't need to wait for me. Uh, Walter, what is it? Hi, hi, Judd, and uh, nice to meet you, David Lucatish. Question is: I saw those two paintings from 1947, and I wondered what prompted Lucatish to switch basically from two dimensions in his murals and paintings, all of a sudden it seems like to three dimensions. What prompted this? Um, well, I, I don't really know, but I, I do know that um, that was the period where many artists went from one form a style, whether it was social realism or surrealism to <laughs> em embrace uh, you know, what was happening post-World War II, post-new, uh, uh, you know, a new world order, so to speak. And all of the ferment that was going on in uh, downtown New York, uh, even though Kadish was uh, an hour or so away, still popped in and I'm sure was, uh, you know, influenced by his friends and. Uh, well, there's a follow up question as well, then, Judd, and that is on those two 1947 paintings. Uh, obviously, that was an Abex kind of uh, uh, milieu, and all of a sudden now he's switching to something again completely different. Was he just experimenting originally, or did it just evolve? I'm sorry, what was the last part? Sorry. Did, did he experiment with sculpture? All of a sudden, or did it just kind of evolve? No, it, it was. Uh, I mean, the quote uh, that he gave was that uh, you know, on on one merry day, uh, he woke up and realized that all of the drawings that he was making uh, in his spare time when he was still farming, they were uh, sculptural. They were in three dimensions, and um, the fact that he was working the land and using his hands and in the dirt in the earth and um, you know it it you know that's what kind of launched him into that um, realm. Was that coincidental with his move to New Jersey? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, very okay. much so. But again, you know, again, I mean, you know, from the time he spent in Burma and Calcutta and visiting temples and, um, you know, the three dimensions. I mean, in you know, many ways, I mean, Pollock, if his life hadn't been cut, you know, short, probably also would have become more of a sculptor. He was very interested in sculpture. Yeah, interesting you say that because when he, just before he died, uh, Pollock, this is, uh, he had rocks dug up behind the house and put into a pile and told his friends that he wanted to do sculpture. And the very last pieces that he made are two small sculptures. They were sand cast plaster, sand but, cast plaster yeah, sand but he, but he plaster. never did um, carve the stones. Uh, they're granite and they wouldn't have been very easy for him to carve, but he had studied sculpture in high school. So he did see that as a path maybe uh, to get around the blockage that was preventing him from painting. But of course, it, it didn't work out. And you could also say, uh, Walter, that, um, you know, you look at an artist like Gustin, and for so many years, he was sort of top rank abex, and then he had that uh, controversial show at Marlboro Gallery in the late 60s with his uh, cartoon-like works and um you know and you can trace that back to the you know 1930s um and the figurative you know urge uh, returned 
I see Richard Pitts has his hand up. You can unmute. I would like you to do. Oh, Richard Pitts. Pitts. Hi. Hi, Jack. Hi. 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 Having a little trouble with your sound. Yeah, we have uh, we had two two uh, machines going at the same time. Uh -huh. I just, I just wanted, wanted to, to say, say Judd, excellent, excellent presentation. presentation. Um, um, I, was I was wondering, wondering if you I ever ran into any uh, word about the friendship of James Rosati and Kadish. Because when I studied with Rube, at uh, Newark School of Fine and Industrial Arts, James Rosati held the position and gave it to Rube. Hmm. Uh, so I was wondering if you knew anything about their friendship. I don't, though I do know that, um, <coughs> you know, offhand remarks from Kadish <coughs> uh, was that he spoke of him in a very like, warm and friendly fashion, but I, I don't know anything specifically. I believe they were neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Do we have any other questions or comments? Oh, wait, I see someone is in the chat. Um, oh, I guess that was Richard. Okay. Well, if there are no other, I, I really wanna thank you, Judd, for going through even even going to the early days of his work, you can see the emotional content. You can see the kind of almost visceral engagement with his subject matter that clearly was informed to some degree by his political uh, feelings and also by his experiences in the war. I don't think that ever really left him. But the work is so powerful, whether two-dimensional or three-dimensional, and really does deserve more exposure. And I'm very happy that Eric Firestone has taken it on, and I hope uh, he'll continue to make it more um, accessible to the public. So next week, I hope you'll all come back and join us again. We will have Jennifer Samet, who was here with us today. And she will be speaking about Jean Reynal, the mosaicist and an early collector of Jackson Pollock's work. And that will be on July 2nd. So please join us for that. And thank you all very much for being with us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.